you know, thanks everybody for, for coming to this session. It looks like I'm your, I'm your gate to lunch. So uh, we just gotta get through this together uh, and then uh, have, some, have some tasty morsels uh, after we're done. So, you know, what I'm looking to do here is I'm looking to start with like a little bit of slideware. You know, we're gonna be together here for, for a little while. Uh, I only have about 20 slides to get through and then we're gonna hop into, you know, an IDE kind of like live generally, uh, you know, kind of scenario for, for the bulk of the time here today. So I'm not expecting you to sit through 70 minutes of slides. So um, hopefully everybody is appreciative of that. All right, so um, just to kind of get started, uh, you know, a lot of this, Next couple of slides will probably not necessarily be news to any of you, but just to kind of, you know, set the table for uh, the genesis of some of the things that I'm going to be talking about here. Um, it's a little bit of a like an intro into you know the impetus behind digital transformation, right? So you know, obviously, everything we're doing uh, in the so-called digital world is software defined, right? So we have. Obviously, code is code. We have, you know, pipelines as code. Now we've got, uh, you know, the, the, the network infrastructure is, is all software defined. So, you know, everything is, is truly software driven, right? And, uh, you know, the, what we're trying to do, everything we're trying to do here, that uh, all this software that's driving our business, uh, it needs to work perfectly, right? Um, it needs to work more perfectly than the text on this slide, because uh, I'm just now noticing that uh, we actually have like a carriage term in the middle of the word perfectly, um, which wasn't there when I looked at the slides earlier. So, um, you know, just another example of, you know, where we actually need things to work right. Now, you know, some of the things that I'm gonna be walking you through here are uh, some techniques that we've actually employed uh, inside of Dynatrace. Um, and it's techniques that, you know, we've kind of taken on the road for the last couple of years, you know, kind of pulling, you know, one piece of technology out, plugging another piece of technology in, in terms of implementation details and things like that. Um, but a lot of this is, is kind of based on some of the things that, that we found internally as we've undergone our own digital transformation. Um, and I think some of this is a little bit interesting because you might think, like, how does a, a you know, a, a vendor that's already a software company, how do they get digitally transformed? Like, shouldn't they be digital to begin with? Um, and you'll find that, you know, the answer is for some vendors that have been around for a while, you know, maybe you didn't actually start off uh, that way. All right, so a little bit of background on, on us, like who is Dynatrace. Um, I actually think the first bullet point here is actually out of date now, um, since the Gartner uh, MQ actually came out uh, just a couple of days ago. So I do believe that, you know, we're at nine, Prime presence uh, presence in the uh, the Gartner uh, Magic Quadrant. Um, you know, and if you look at some of the analyst details, we actually are the, the market leader in terms of market share for for APM. Um, and when we talk about some of the the new technology bits uh, that I'm showing you today, the new Dynatrace platform, you know, this has seen some pretty some pretty explosive growth. So um, this is kind of a great opportunity for me to get. Uh, some audience participation. So, like, how many people actually know the name Dynatrace? Right? Great, great number of hands raised. Um, how many of people knew the name Dynatrace before you came here? Right? Oh, good, good. Okay. And then, so how many people were familiar with Atmon versus the new Dynatrace? Right? Cool. So, are, are you, so when you're raising, maybe I asked that question really poorly. So, did you folks were more familiar with Atmon than the new Dynatrace maybe? You might have been Atmon users, is that correct? Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, a lot of what, what I'm talking about here is obviously, um, you know, the transformation that, we're, that, that has happened to us has been powered by, or, or maybe even necessitated by, our transition from the Atmon product base and the, you know, kind of R&D processes there to the new Dynatrace. Right. With the new Dynatrace, you know, we're, we're delivering software via processes that are going to be very similar to, you know, perhaps the processes that, that your organizations are, are, are trying to go to. And one of those key figures there is that, you know, we have, with the new Dynatrace, we have 26 major releases a year, right? In the past, with the Atmon product, you know, we would have four, right? And that's a, that's a pretty big shift. It's actually pretty hard to do that. Um, you know, six and a half years ago is about when we uh, we began this journey. Uh, you know, Dynatrace likes to call uh, call our current 
state, um, something that we call no ops. And I know everybody is kind of got a little bit of overload of like, you know, appending ops to some other down or putting it in front of another down. Um, you know, the way that we define our, our no ops journey is, is, you know, the folks that might have traditionally been ops people and then the folks that might have traditionally been DevOps people, like the people that transitioned into the DevOps role have now transitioned into a pure dev role, right? So we don't actually necessarily have people that actually fulfill the former kind of ops type of role. Like our DevOps folks now are predominantly responsible for flipping feature blocks, right? So these are folks that, you know, we basically have a Slack channel and we say, hey, I need this feature flag enabled on this certain Dynatrace tenant, and they go do that for us in a couple of minutes, right? And the folks that might have been responsible for that more kind of devops -y type of role, or, you, know, uh, you know, building pipelines and stuff like that, those folks are properly 100% part of sprint teams now, right? And, and we began that journey about uh, six and a half years ago. Um, and you know, where we're trying to go is, uh, you know, we have this vision of self-driving IT. You know, uh, I'm not actually like super well versed in like how they actually define those, you know, levels of automation in cars, but I believe like what we're kind of trying to get to is that like level three, fully hands-off uh, automation where you know, a lot of these things that are happening in these environments, the developer is pushing code and that code is make if that code is good, it's going to get to production automatically. Right? You know, one of the one of the metrics that you know we're actually trying to get to at some point, you know, with, with both ourselves and a lot of our customers is we'd like to see code make it into product an hour after it's committed. Right? That's kind of like a good uh, you know a good level set of, of something that we're trying to get to. And the idea is is that you know, you remove humans from this process, right? And we automate everything with pipelines, like what I'm gonna show you in a little bit with concourse, right? If we eliminate humans from the process as much as possible, we can eliminate many of the mistakes, right? So it, it's all it's all gonna be about, you know, kind of detecting things and, and failing fast, uh, which allows us to actually deploy faster and maybe take a little bit more uh, risk uh, in production, right? And, you know, one of the reasons we started actually taking uh, the story on the road here a little bit is, you know, this these types of methodologies have actually been pretty successful for us. Like, if you look at this, um, you know, that 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 kind of middle bar there about the number of production bugs. Now, mind you, the the date on the slide is is perhaps a little out of date um, as it represents 2017. But you know, in the past, you know, before we adopted a lot of these processes internally, you know, a lot of production bugs were actually reported by our customers, right? That's not really a great place to be. You know, ideally, we'd like to actually find some of those bugs ourselves, right? It makes things easier and support people. It actually, you know, makes uh, makes everybody's lives a little bit easier. As developers, you don't have to get onto a call at, at midnight because somebody found like a, a P1 defect, right? So the sooner you find these things, um, the sooner they can be, you know, it actually takes less time to fix them and it costs less uh, to fix problems earlier in the life cycle, right? Uh, and obviously, you know, <laughs> this EC2 number is probably woefully out of date because, you know, if you have, you know, 750 to, to like 1700% growth in a, in a SaaS platform, like I think this number of EC2 instances now, I think might actually be somewhere in the 10,000 uh, range. But, uh, you know, so what is, what is the challenge about, you know, getting us to this point, right? You know, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to deliver better software faster, right? Sounds like a pretty noble goal. Sounds uh, pretty achievable. But, you know, one of the things that we found, and perhaps a lot of you have found this as well, is that just taking your app and putting it in a container, or just taking your app and putting it on, uh, you know, PCF or, or what have you, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're cloud native, right? You have a, that means you have a cloud native application delivery platform, but that doesn't necessarily mean all of your processes are as well. And, you know, so we've been, you know, building out this, this offering, something that we call uh, ECM, uh, Thomas Cloud Management. And as we were preparing that, we started querying our customer base, right? So we found that, you know, the vast majority of folks are, are actually not truly cloud native yet in terms of, you know, how we've actually defined that. 
Um, the 95th percentile of our customer base can actually get a piece of code into prod two days after it's been committed. But the median, it takes two and a half weeks, right? You know, how many business impacting deployments happen? So that's kind of like, you know, issues that are actually detected in prod, something that's actually negatively impacting revenue or something like that. You know, our 95th percentile customer is actually only seeing, you know, one out of uh, 10 deployments negatively impacting uh, the business. But the median is three out of 10, right? And then when we actually look at, you know, how many times do we have to actually patch something that we've deployed to production? How many times do we have to deploy optics? The 95th percentile have a, has a nice zero there. That's a, that's, a, that's a pretty good number. But the median, the average customer, is actually more like three hot fixes per uh, production deployment. Right? And then when we talk about how much time does it actually identify some, you know, how much, how much time does it take from identifying the problem to actually fixing it? Right? The 95th percentile customer actually can find a problem and fix it within four hours. But the median customer, you know, you're talking almost five days. Right? So, you know, when we start talking about some of the, you know, uh, measurables around implementing some of the techniques uh, I'm going to talk about here, um, we look at having a 75% reduction in production incidents, right? Because we're going to have a higher level of quality before we get to prod by, by detecting those problems earlier and, and addressing them earlier. Um, and then one of the really kind of cool big numbers is like a 97% reduction in deployment lead time, right? So, so by taking advantage of some of these capabilities, you're looking to be able to deliver uh, software more rapidly in the production. Um, and then obviously, you know, with that, uh, you know, more rapid deployment process, you can, you know, significantly up uh, the, the release process. And when we, when we say this number, like this 26 number, that's like 26 major releases. Right, like a lot of folks that um, you know are doing, you know, continuous delivery, continuous deployment really well. Like a release is going to be like a single, you know, CSS change or something like that. Something that doesn't necessarily constitute uh, a major change. Like when we talk about this, we're talking about like a a major, like maybe not necessarily major in terms of like you know semantic versioning, but you know we're talking about incrementing that 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 middle number uh, in your in your semantic version. We're not talking about like patch releases, right? Those patch releases, you might have hundreds of those a, a day, right? We're talking about being able to, to deliver uh, a major release on a more frequent basis, right? Cool. So, uh, you know, let's, I'm going to try and kind of go through some of these a little bit quicker because they're uh, a little bit annoying. Um, but when we start taking a look at the breakable continuous delivery of action, like what we found is there's kind of like a uh, a, a pyramid of uh, capabilities here, right? And one of the things that as I start to, to talk about uh, some of these things, I, my personal take is actually kind of reordering this pyramid just a little bit. Um, this pyramid is generated by some of my colleagues and I actually think some of these things are uh, maybe a little bit more impactful and a little bit easier to do than some of my colleagues do. But the the base of the pyramid, the 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 thing that could best be defined as you must be this tall to ride on this roller coaster is um, actually having a consistent monitoring strategy across you know all of the different deployment uh, methodologies, right? So having the same kind of tooling, uh, uh, you know, across all of the environments, dev test, stage, and prod, having the same tooling across you know on-prem, public cloud, having the same tooling across you know your your bare VM strategy as well as your container strategy. That's kind of like the the, the base of everything. Um, and then what this particular slide is taking uh, shift left as kind of the number two. I actually think shift left is number three and I think shift right is number two, right? So when we talk about shift left and shift right, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with that concept, um, but basically shifting right, the thing that I feel is really important is taking metadata about your, your build Right, taking metadata about what it is that you're actually trying to do with the release, uh, and bringing that into your monitoring tooling as an event that's associated with, uh, you know, the the environment that you're monitoring. 
right? And that's really important for you know triaging issues and things like that to understand the context of what it was that was deployed into the environment. Um, and then when we talk about shifting left, right? Shifting left is taking some of those uh, metrics and techniques that you might have been deploying in production around monitoring and shifting those earlier in the life cycle, right? So when I start talking to you about well, what here at Dynatrace, what we like to call quality gates, that's the that's the concept of, of shifting left. And and why I personally reverse these is because I feel like the the getting build metadata and events in the prod that's like really low risk um, and really high reward. So I feel like that's something that that really everybody should be doing one way or another, and it's not that hard to do that. Um, when we talk about the automated quality gates, as I as I walk you through those, those are a little bit tougher, right? And those can be, you know, maybe a little bit riskier for people, might be a little bit scary, right? Because we, you know, these these automated quality gates, those are the kinds of things that are standing between uh, continuous delivery and continuous deployment, right? The automated quality gates are one of the things that can help you get there, but continuous deployment is actually super scary, right? So so that's kind of why I uh, invert this pyramid uh, a little bit. So uh, I got a nice slide here that actually helps to uh, illustrate this. And, and one of my marketing guys actually just left the room. And it's really funny because we were talking about another way to visualize this. Um, and the example that I actually came up with is the concourse pipeline that I'm going to be walking you through. So it's very possible that this slide may or may not be completely replaced in the future with a visualization of a, of a concourse pipeline because it does a really great job of that. Um, but basically, you know, the, the, the stages that we're talking about here is, you know, the first thing you're doing is you're actually taking your, uh, your deployment in your staging environment and you're giving the context of that deployment to your monitoring tool, right? The second stage is approving what it was that you released in the stage, right? Um, and you're going to do that with an automated quality gate. Um, and obviously, I'll, I'll talk to you guys in a, in a little bit about what's actually in that quality gate. Um, and then the third step is uh, once that quality gate has been validated, we're going to push in the prod, right? Um, my example is going to be pushing in the prod with like a blue green, right? So that's going to be a little bit scary when just you know full on pushing in the prod automatically. Uh, but once we've actually validated prod, right, then we you know uh, we'll be able to flip the switch you know on the route for a blue green deployment. Um, hopefully our customers are happy. Um, if they're not happy, uh, the idea is that you know what we're working towards now uh, here at Dynatrace is, is you know automated remediation action, right? So if we detect a problem and your monitoring solution understands the root cause of that problem, then we can actually take action to remedy that uh, automatically. So we're getting near the end of the slides. So I hope everybody's excited. That I am. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to mention, so my, my colleagues in the back of the room there, Johannes is, is back there, he's sort of kind of half wave. Um, he did a little bit of a hands-on um, of what we're calling our, our captain project or captain initiative. Um, the whole idea here is, is that um, as we started to deliver uh, autonomous cloud management with our customer base, we found that there was kind of a need to uh, take an opinionated approach to creating the pipelines for continuous delivery. Right, so the captain project basically will take your uh, deliverable artifact, whatever that might be, and automatically uh, create some of the pipelines that I'm going to show you today. It's going to automatically create those, automatically create the uh, quality gates, um, and then it's going to automatically create uh, deployment models based on you know what it is that you put in some some YAML guidewires. Right, so it's like you know maybe you want to do. Uh, you know, canary for this particular release, you want to do uh, blue green for this other one, you're actually going to provide those guidelines in some YAML, and then Captain is going to go out and, and build all of that for you. Right? Um, and then I would be remiss um, if I didn't include this super fun slide about the Dynatrace UFO. Um, the reason why I've included this is uh, the Dynatrace UFO is actually one of the ways that I got started working with Concourse myself. Um, the UFO is this crazy little thing here, and it's something that you know one of the one of the crazy developers in our Lint's office found that you know we didn't have enough information radiators. Uh, for example, there wasn't an information radiator above the coffee machine, so developers would actually commit code and destroy and break everything, uh, and nobody would know until like they kind of got back to their desk or whatever. 
So we started including these information radiators around the office to continuously emit the status of our pipelines. Um, and I thought that was a really cool idea. It's basically this little like 3D printed device with a Raspberry Pi inside, and the whole design and firmware is all open source, available uh, you know via this URL here. Um, and when I saw that device, and I saw like the on pass on fail functionality inside of Concourse, I'm like, I'm going to make a Concourse resource to talk to the UFO, right? And once I saw how cool and easy that was, then I started actually you know, kind of diving into things uh, a little bit more in depth. Um, this is a kind of pure marketing slide um, with a little bit of fancy animation there, um, where we talk about some of the benefits of Benetrace, but I don't really want to dive into that very, very much. Um, and there's a couple of nice logos up here of some of the folks that have started to implement uh, some of the techniques that I'm talking about here today. Uh, you know, one of the things that I find really interesting is one of the reasons why I'm doing this talk is because I'm personally like a really big fan of Concourse, and Pat and James know this. They're actually sitting in the back of the back of the office, back of the room there. Um, like, I actually really like the way Concourse functions and the way Concourse handles their deployments, and I really wish more people were using it for apps. Right? We're all using it for you know our well. I can't. I guess I can't say all of us, but a lot of us are actually already using Concourse to deploy our our PaaS and PKS foundations. Um, but I'd really like to see more people actually using it for the applications as well. So the example, you know, what I'm walking everybody through today is going to be using Concourse to deploy an app, right? Um, and then the dive time is coming up now. Um, what I'm going to be walking everybody through is deploying Spring Music of Concourse. Not sure if anybody's from with Spring Music. I know I see the damn thing while I'm sleeping because um, I just probably work with Spring Music way too much. Um, Place. All right. So, uh, so first things first, we got this nice, uh, super small thing because our my resolution here is bad. So I'm zooming in a little bit. Right. So, how many people here have actually seen a Concourse pipeline? Oh, awesome! Got a lot of hands raised. So, I mean, so are are any of you actually using Concourse? Okay, yeah, hands raised, and I suspect that the vast majority of you are using your Concourse for the platform itself, right? And is anybody using Concourse for their apps? Great, that's awesome. I'm sure folks are are, are happy to happy to hear that. Because once again, obviously, like I'm a I'm a big fan, and I really wish you know more more people were uh, were doing this. But when we take a look at um, you know what we have in the pipeline here. Uh, we get this nice visualization of, of uh, you know what's actually happening, right? So the the glue that's kind of binding everything together here, this this main dash line, uh, solid line that goes through everything, is the the repo containing my code base. Um, so once we actually when we actually look at the YAML, um, the way that that's configured is to act as a trigger. So when I make a change to my code base on GitHub, it's going to automatically configure everything to flow through the pipeline. Uh, we start with unit tests, pretty standard practice. Um, if the unit tests pass, we're going to build our uh, we're going to build our binary. In this case, it's Spring Music, so we're building a Spring Loop jar. Um, and then once that's built, we deploy it. Crazy, right? Actually, deploying built artifacts, nobody does that. Um, and then you know, we're this this first step is actually deploying into into my stage, uh, the stage environment of my uh, PaaS foundation. Um, after that deploys, we're going to automatically execute a load test. Uh, we're going to automatically validate that load test. Um, this is uh, kind of the, the, the quality gate uh, that I talked about, right? So one of the cool things then about Converse and how these visualizations help is, uh, you know, this solid line here is once I've done my deployment, um, I'm also letting Dynatrace know that I've done the deployment. Um, this is something that's happening automatically uh, with that Converse resource. Um, and then this validation, you know, when we start to actually when I show you some of the data elements that we're validating, um, what we're doing here is um, we're executing a comparison via something that uh, we here at Dynatrace call Monspec. Uh, surprisingly, it's actually very familiar to those of you that, that, that might have been talking to Pivotal about indicator protocol. Um, it just so happened that both of us were kind of actually working on almost the same thing at the same time. So Monspec is JSON-based, indicator protocol is YAML-based, but basically what we're doing in both of these uh, items is 
you know, defining the guidelines for our application as code in a way that we're checking those in to our, to our repo alongside of our code, right? So as developers, you're building the application. This is a way for you to uh, document your NFRs, your non-functional requirements. It's a way for you to document those uh, and then validate them automatically. And what you might be thinking here is like, okay, well, response time, things like that, I'm already validating that with my, you know, my performance tests. What's really neat here is you can actually start to validate some of the architectural requirements and things like that as well, right? So when I actually show you what non-spec looks like, um, we'll be validating something, uh, a value called runs on, right? Which is how many instances of it do I have? So if I've asked for two instances, am I really getting two instances? If I've asked for four, am I really getting four instances or am I only getting one? And if I don't get four, I should probably fail. Uh, and then we're also gonna validate talkers. Right, so we're also gonna validate like, hey, this particular service is talking to four other services, right? Which I think is, is something that's, that's really important because we do see a lot of regressions where you know somebody created a service and maybe forgot to use a standardized configuration, right? And they might have you know one service instead of talking to four services, somehow it's talking to six or 12 or 40, right? It's important to, to actually start to validate um, some of your architectural NFRs uh, as well. And that's where, you know, including this APM data in the mix can be really helpful, right? Um, and then as we start to scroll to the right of the pipeline, right, you start to see that basically what we've done is repeat, we've repeated that process, right? Um, the cool thing about Monspec is uh, we can actually define uh, different comparisons to make and different data elements to maybe track depending upon environments. So like if, for example, we weren't as concerned with runs on in stage, well, then we don't have to validate that, right? You can actually define those things on a, on a per environment basis. Um, but once again, there's this uh, validate prod step. Um, and then when everything's done, uh, I'm gonna promote that new release in prod, which is basically automatically building the runs, right? Cool, so that seemed pretty, pretty clear to everybody. Um, we're gonna actually now, I think I can actually swipe the right way. Um, we're gonna actually take a look at what that pipeline actually starts to look like. So, uh, being that this is a deep dive, we're gonna be kind of walking through the line items of the pipeline here, so hopefully that's okay with everybody. Um, I'm not gonna start with the groups, but that's not, uh, that's not really as important. Um, but one of the things that we define here at the top of our pipeline is our uh, resource types, right? So those are the things that we're gonna be uh, calling out later to do some work for us. Um, and, you know, assuming I don't babble on too much about unimportant things, I'd actually kind of like to show you what a, what a concourse resource actually looks like. Because they're actually really fun to build. Maybe I'm weird, I don't know, but I actually had a really uh, good time with that. Uh, but you can see the two, the two resources here. Sadly, I didn't bring my UFO with me. Um, but I do have the, uh, the UFO resource here defined. Um, and then I do have the Dynatrace resource. So, so the Dynatrace resource is, is basically what's going to enable that uh, shift right functionality. Um, and basically, you know, resources are uh, Docker images that are going to uh, take an expected payload and do something with it. Um, and it's something that you know my uh, you know my Dynatrace my resources are not necessarily taking advantage of all the available functionality. Um, I have some ideas on improving them in the future, but mostly I'm just going to take some information uh, and, and do something with it. Uh, we can see here, obviously, we've got a Git repo here with, uh, uh, with the information in it. The cool thing here is if anybody actually gets a picture of this and actually takes a look at uh, GitHub slash Akirasoft slash Spring Music, they'll actually, I have all the pipelines there, so you can actually take a look at it. So the pipelines are all there along with all the tasks uh, that make this up. All right, so we've got a we've got a Sunbird resource here, which is hopefully pretty familiar to everybody. This is how we actually handle our versioning. Um, the cool thing about Concourse is uh, every time you run a task, it's completely in like a net new container. Um, so that's actually super useful. I'm not sure how many of you actually ran into like weird, uh, you know, issues with a file system on your Jenkins workers having unexpected things on it or your Jenkins workers having, uh, you know, unexpected processes running and things like that, and you don't necessarily get a nice repeatable result. Um, what's really cool here is every time a task fires, it's in a new container. 
Uh, that's probably the thing that I like the most, um, but can sometimes be a little difficult for folks to wrap their head around is like, anytime you need something, you need to explicitly define it so that it comes along. Otherwise, it's not there, right? Um, my pipeline is actually building the release artifact and putting it out on S3. Um, so you can see here, that's actually uh, defined here. You know, we got a little bit of fun regex, kind of doing some pattern matching there. Uh, this pipeline is originally based on kind of like a reference example from the physical team. Um, and then you can see here that I've got my uh, stage and prod uh, foundations defined. So, you know, that what's nice about those being two completely different things, obviously, is those could be completely different foundations, or in my case, they're just different orders. Right? Uh, and then I need to actually define uh, a couple of elements that the, uh, the Dynatrace resource needs. So when you're interacting with Dynatrace's APIs, you need an API token, and then you obviously need to know, the, you know, which, which Dynatrace tenant you're going to interact with. So the cool thing there is that that's going to automatically detect, uh, based on the URL, it's going to automatically detect whether you're managed, right, which is our on-prem solution, uh, versus the SaaS solution. So it's going to kind of automatically uh, detect some of that stuff for you based on the formatting of the, uh, the host name, right? So uh, one of the things that this pipeline does is it's going to take a snapshot of the performance data associated with your release um, and post it up to Dynatrace. So Dynatrace has this concept of a custom device. It was functionality that we originally created to store data about like a five load balancers and things like that, things that we want to monitor, but we don't have an agent for them because an agent doesn't make sense. Um, so we're going to take that that uh, that snapshot and we're going to upload that data there so that you know we can kind of chart all of those things in the same place later if we wanted to. Uh, so the nice thing about Concourse is with your groups, you know, like the the Concourse team likes to call Concourse an automated thing doer. So this is a step that's actually not always run as part of the pipeline. It ran once, but the cool thing here is since it's part of the pipeline, if something happens to my environment, I can actually just fire this task off again. Uh, and it's always going to do so in a nice, repeatable way, right? Great. All right. So now we start to actually look at the the, the nitty gritty tasks of the of the job, right? So obviously we start at a at a unit test, right? So it's going to get the contents of our repo, which is the source code. You can see here, as I mentioned before, uh, this is kind of key. This is what actually helps us to make sure that that pipeline runs every time we submit a change. So that's the that's the trigger, um, and then here is where we actually define which task it is that we're going to run in, in this step. Um, I'm probably not going to walk through all of them. Uh, I actually want to start actually showing the contents of the task uh, when I get into some of the more interesting ones. All right? Cool. So now we get into our build step. So we've we've actually you know passed our unit test. Right now we're going to actually start building our binary. Um, if I did show you the contents of that, you'd see that that's actually just, you know, basically running a Gradle build. Um, and, you know, we've got some timeouts there in case for some reason the build takes too long. Um, but here's kind of the neat part, right? So we're getting the contents of the, of the repo. So as I mentioned before, the cool thing about Concourse is, you know, every time one of these tasks run, you have to explicitly define what's going to be there when it runs. So we actually need to go back and get the contents of our repo again, right? And it's going to cache that, so it's nice, it's really fast, right? But in order for that stuff to be in the container, in order for us to depend on that stuff being there, um, you need to actually explicitly uh, define that you're getting it. Um, we're also going to uh, get that Semver file, so there's like a file sitting on S3 that actually has the version number in it, so we're going to get that. Um, and then we're also going to increment the patch version, right? Because we're building a patch right now, right? Um, and then now is when we start to actually do some puts, right? So everything else has been getting data. Now we're actually going to do something with that data, right? So we're going to take and we're going to, that artifact that we built, the jar that we built, we're going to shove that up on S3. Um, you know, we don't have to define everything about that again because it's already defined at the top of the pipeline, right? Um, and then we're also going to uh, put a tag uh, up on GitHub, so this release you know, that source code in that point in time is actually going to be tagged uh, on GitHub at a release. Uh, and then obviously, since we did 
you know, increment the version number. So we incremented the patch. Uh, we need to go back and put that file back up on S3, right? It pretty much makes sense to everybody. Awesome. All right. So now, now we've got an artifact. Now we've got to build artifact. So now we're now we're really starting to to cook with gas or magnets, induction, uh, whatever. Um, so now that we've actually got that artifact, we want to start doing something with it, right? If we just had artifacts, we're not really going to have much of a fun time. Uh, and then there's going to be nothing to validate with time trips. So um, we've obviously got to go back and get the December number, right? We've got to get that release artifact. Um, and then we have to, um, I have a step here to actually do my uh, blue-green deployments by uh, and actually prepare some of the tags that Diamond Trace needs to automatically identify things. So I'm going to dynamically manipulate uh, my app manifest. Uh, and then I'm going to tell Diamond Trace, hey, there's a new release. right? And then here is where I define uh, some of the uh, information that Dynatrace needs to you know, represent uh, that release, that deployment event, right? So there's a couple of different things that happen here. So when I when I actually flip over to actually show you mom spec, I'm trying to think of a good time to, to flip over to that. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, Converse doesn't have anything there unless you explicitly add it. So since I am including the information, some of the metadata around my pipeline as well as the metadata around my uh, mom spec in my app repo, um, I need to tell this task where that might be in the container file system. Because obviously, you know, for Spring Music, I'll have a Spring Music folder with all the contents of that repo in it. But if I took this same, um, if I took the same concept and implemented it in another piece of technology or another application, that path would be different. Uh, so I do need to actually give that that path uh, to the resource uh, because we actually do some kind of funny things with uh, something we call a, a, a pipeline definition JSON so that Dynatrace can actually pre-populate uh, some of that information for us, right? Um, and then this step here is basically doing the CF push for us, right? So we don't have to actually shell out and do the CF push ourselves. Uh, it's happening for us automatically, right? So now we start to look at uh, the load tests, right? So here we've actually got uh, the load tests are running. Uh, you'll notice here nothing is actually defining um, how the load test is actually executed. That's actually in the in the task. So I think now is probably a good time to maybe show some tasks so you can actually see what uh, what a task looks like. So if we actually look at this load test YAML, which is where we uh, define what it is that we're actually executing. So once again, you'll see that I've got a definition of a Docker image, right? Um, and you'll see that this is expecting some inputs, you know, because once again, nothing is there unless we tell it to be there. Because if I didn't have any of this stuff there, all I would have would be whatever is the, the vanilla contents of that Docker image, right? Um, once again, this is asking for a, a couple of different uh, options here because a couple of different parameters because otherwise it wouldn't know uh, what it needs to actually execute a, a load test against. And then you can see here this is the script that we're actually calling, right? Cool. So now we look at uh, what does the task actually look like? So the, the, the cool thing here is that it kind of looks like whatever you want it to look like, right? So this one is a, uh, is a shell script. Um, it's actually going to look for a flag to tell us whether it's production or not, because in production I'm doing that blue-green deployment, so I need to figure out whether I want to talk to blue or whether I want to talk to green. Um, and then otherwise, I'm just going to run, uh, I'm going to run a load test against uh, this particular URL. Uh, and then, you know, here it's basically just a, a, a call out to artillery to, to go run a load test. Um, I did, artillery was actually the, the tooling that was part of the sample. Um, but this could be Jmeter or you know whatever you might want to have here. Um, I actually kind of like artillery. I'm not sure if anybody actually works with that on a regular basis, but I was actually reasonably impressed with what it was able to do. Um, and then you know one of the things that's inside of artillery that actually helps Dynatrace to make sense of it is to uh, add some headers, right? So this can actually these are this is really all you need to make Dynatrace aware that those are load test requests is to actually add these headers to those requests, which is 
uh, kind of a nice, concise way to do this. It's a pretty simple test, but you can see it's only like 16 lines. All right, so let's go back to my editor, close my other pipeline. All right, so let's scroll down a little bit. So now, now we're going to actually start to look at um, some of the more interesting, um, your more interesting tasks. All right. So now I've got a build that has been deployed to my staging environment. All right. I've executed some load tests against that environment. Now I'm going to pull some data down and and take a look at at executing some comparisons. Right. So uh, you can see here, you know, once again, obviously it's got to do that uh, current app color test task because uh, that actually definitely helps in the in the prod environment, right? But when we look at this one, this is kind of the the nitty gritty of the quality of the the quality here, right? Is this validate via Monspa, right? So what I need to do here is I need to define what comparison that I'm making, right? And this is actually kind of giving us a, a path to the to the contents of the JSON file. Uh, and then I need to actually give it uh, some information on how to collect the entry, right? So when we look at what's actually happening in this uh, this task, right? So the nice thing here is you'll see that we don't have any curl in here. There's no requests out to the APIs. Uh, one of my colleagues, Andy Grabner, uh, created a dot trace CLI in Python. So one of the cool things here is you know, once again, obviously these tasks can be kind of any arbitrary body of work that we want to execute. So in this case, I'm actually just running this uh, Python-based CLI. Um, I'm telling it to configure itself with the information on how to connect the data trace. Um, and then I'm going to tell it what it needs to validate, right? So I'm going to tell the CLI that we need to do a monspec pull compare. Um, here is our monspec file, and I'm going to show you that momentarily. Um, here's the pipeline information, and then it's going to take this variable that was defined back in the pipeline, and it's going to say, okay, I want to do this comparison. Right? And I'm going to do this comparison for the last five minutes. Right? I'm going to get that output. I'm going to redirect that output to a file. And just because I like to gold plate things, I'm um, uh, pretty printing it. Right? Because then when we actually go back and look at this in concourse, it's actually going to give us that pretty printed output of that step, uh, along with the color coding and everything. It's actually pretty slick. Um, and then I'm going to, this is actually right here, is really just our, our validation, right? Because the, the actual uh, Python CLI is not going to give us an exit status if, any, if it's detected violation. So we need to actually create that exit status ourselves, right? But it's a simple matter of, of you know, evaluating. Uh, whether or not that that particular value in that JSON body is uh, something other than is greater than zero, right? So let's take a look at Monspec. Right. Let's see here, right? So there's a couple of different things that we do here. So one of the things that um, rather than you know hard code a link to a specific like service entity in Dynatrace, because sometimes those things can be kind of fluid. Um, we're actually just uh, giving a, a key value pair in tags that we want to look at. And so Dynatrace has this ability to uh, dynamically create tags, you know, based on, you know, environment variables. So these are just environment variables that happen to be in the app manifest. So we're going to take those um, and we're going to turn those into tags uh, that will actually then be able to query Dynatrace based on those tags to figure out what uh, entities we want to fetch data from, right? So you can see here, I've actually, you know, obviously got an entry here for stage. Um, I've got an entry for uh, production in its entirety. Uh, and then I got tags that are, that are color-based for the blue and green production, right? Uh, the next thing that we do in this JSON is we start to uh, define the comparisons that we want to make, right? So do we, you have the, this is actually pretty free form, so you can you can compare staging to production. You can compare production to staging. You can compare production to staging, and you can say, um, "Hey, I know that production is faster than staging," and you can actually kind of build, you know, what used to be a fudge factor. You can actually build that into the monspec definition uh, and include that uh, type of criteria uh, when you're validating that. 
All right, so you can see I, I have a whole bunch of stuff in here. I don't necessarily use all of these, but they're there for reference um, if I ever want to change something. All right, so when we talk about the guide rails that we're actually looking to validate via the non-spec comparison, that's, that's performance signature, right? So that's the perf signature here in, in my JSON. And these time series values are elements of uh, demonstrates API responses, right? So service response time, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, we have the ability to uh, collect the different metrics that represent the service response time. So you can see here, we're actually looking at the average. Here we can look at the 90th percentile. It, it's almost entirely uh, arbitrary, so I could change that to 99%. Um, one of the things that I do when I'm building these pipelines or when I'm helping my customer build pipelines like this is uh, I will actually define upper and lower limits. Uh, normally in production with a tool like Ventrace, you let Ventrace detect your guidelines, right, for alerting. But in your stage environment and things like that, usually you don't have enough traffic for uh, like anomalies to be detected automatically, right? Because there's just, there's no steady state traffic in that environment. So what we do is we actually define some of that criteria right here in the monspec, right? So this is once again where I talk about codifying those non-functional requirements, documenting them as part of your pipeline, uh, as part of your, your repo, and it just sits there along with the code, right? And then rather than interacting with, you know, your performance engineering team or something like that, this is something that you as a developer define and, and check in as part of your code base, right? And you know, we, we start to look at things like failure rate, request per minute, these are all pretty uh, standard things, but this is where I think some of this starts to get really interesting, right? So these two relationships calls are things that query the, what, what Dynatrace calls the Smartscape API. Uh, Smartscape is our topology map of the environment. That's where we, we understand who's talking to who um, and how many times they're talking and, and so on and so forth. So this is one of the things that I really, really like about this concept is validating some of the architecture of the application, right? So that's who's talking to it, how many instances of it are running, um, and who is it talking to, right? So the to relationship is who's calling it, the from relationship is uh, who is it talking to, right? So I think these are some kind of really interesting things to validate. Um, you know, if we just sat here and talked about requests per minute and response time, well, you get that already out of your performance testing tool, right? It's some of these architectural validations are the things that can be really impactful for us uh, and, and really helpful. Uh, and you know, and then we have the ability to define key requests, but I'm not, uh, I'm not actually using that functionality, right? So uh, I'm going to push the prod. Looks exactly like the push the stage. Um, we're kind of going to go through this whole process of actually uh, putting it into Dynatrace. We're going to do a load test again. Uh, we're going to validate that again. Uh, and then we're going to look at the routes. So uh, I'm going to flop back over to my browser if I can find it because I want to show you how uh, that validation uh, can actually be kind of interesting and, and fun. Uh, super small again. Right. So what I mentioned before, like the, the concourse is actually just going to give us the standard out of whatever it is that we're running inside of our uh, task. So what's really neat here then, obviously, is by pretty printing that, it's actually going to take all the nice uh, pretty colors coming out of uh, GQ uh, and allow us to see this, right? And you can see that uh, you know as we as we scroll through here, uh, we have no monspec uh, violations, right? But I think I actually have enough time that I should be able to make it break. So this might actually, it takes a few minutes to actually run and deploy, but see if I can get that for longer than I expected to. All right, so I've committed that change up to my repo. Um, I have done very bad things to spring music, and I have a configurable, you know, thread that sleep in there because it's nice and easy to demo that. Um, and you know what's going to happen here eventually is, you know, it takes a minute or two, but what, okay, you can see that well, it's already started to fire. So it detected that I made a change to the code base. In this case, I just altered the manifest to adjust the environment variable that defines how long that thread is going to sleep for. Um, and it's going to go through this build process. 
then it's going to be load tested, and then what's going to happen is this validation is going to fail. Okay? But it's going to take us about five minutes or so to get there. So I think while this is happening, it's actually a really great time to uh, pause and kind of ask some questions, because this is the point where we just wait for a box to turn around. <laughs> So are there, are there any questions? I, I didn't lose all of you, lost a few of you, uh, but I didn't lose everybody. Um, so are there, are there any kind of questions here? Does, does anybody kind of see the, the validity of the workflow? Right. Somebody, somebody's gotta, gotta break the ice here. No? Yeah, so, so it's actually really funny you ask that because the, the, the concepts that you see here were you know, originally developed by my colleagues um, against Jenkins, right? And against um, the, uh, whatever the hell the, the Amazon pipeline tool is, right? So what I really personally like about Concourse is that whole concept of every time you do something, it, what's there is only what you said to be there. Right? Because literally every single time my colleagues have created a workshop against Jenkins, there is always some crap that's there that they didn't expect to be there. Right? It does weird things with like renaming workspace directories and stuff like that. You end up having like like out of nowhere permissions issues. You know, like what is this about? And it's just because some directory is left hanging. And the way you fix that is you go and you rename the project, which creates a new directory for you. Here you don't need to do that because every single time you run something, it's in a net new container. Um, one of the things that was really hard for me when I was getting started with, with, with Concourse was uh, understanding that there really wasn't a lot there by default, right? It's like everything else that like Pivotal tends to do is a, it's like it's a very abstracted thing. Um, and, but then once I realized like, wow, this is really abstracted, and I can literally do anything I want in a task, I'm like, this is amazing, right? Like, I pretty much, like, I love automation, and I would, like, like to build contrast pipelines that I can just automate my entire life away, and I can just lay in bed all day. And, like, theoretically, you can do that, because this is not limited to software delivery, it's not limited to, you know, delivering your applications, like, you can do, so many different things with it, and like this is my real concourse environment, right? So I have the pipeline here that's actually deploying PaaS. I've got the pipeline here that's actually deploying my PKS environment, right? And then you know the other thing that I needed to do is my colleagues that are manning the booth um, need to have something to demo. So I have a uh, a, a service that I'm actually going to be demoing this afternoon, where I have a front end and a Java application in PaaS, in PAS, that are talking to two services that are in PKS, right? Um, and we've broken that service, so I have one pipeline that is actually, this was the way that I chose to do it here because it was easier, but I have one pipeline that actually deploys the good version, and I have another pipeline that deploys the bad version. So what I can do is I can deploy the bad version, let it sit there for a couple of minutes, so Dynatrace will, will lose its mind. Um, and then, you know, a couple of minutes later, I can deploy the good version again. And then what will happen is the Dynatrace problem will solve itself because it's no longer occurring, right? And then, you know, this, this pipeline, like I mentioned, you know, one of the things that I wanted to double down for everybody is you'll notice this pipeline actually doesn't do the quality gate, but it does do the, the, the Dynatrace resource to tell Dynatrace that a build took place because then Dynatrace will take that information and include that in the root cause analysis, right? And, and this is like, if everybody leaves here with one idea, right, one thing that you can take back with you and do, it's definitely let your, you know, whatever your monitoring solution is, assuming it can do something with that data, is to take and make that you know, make, make it aware of what's actually happening in the environment. Give it more context, right? Because one of the cool things about Dynatrace is we use all of that context to help you find out what the root cause of an issue is. So without the context, you know, you have that information available to you, just, you know, push it into your monitoring tool. So, um, 
So that's 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 a couple of the uh, the that's a couple of the things that that I found. Um, you know, when I actually look into you know building the resource itself, right? There's like a predefined payload of, of what that actually looks like, um, but it's pretty easy to reason with because it's just JSON. Um, everything that I'm doing is is like shell scripts. The you know, but it doesn't have to be shell scripts. You can you know, you saw one of my shell scripts was actually calling a Python CLI, right? You could actually interact with a Go CLI command directly, right? In just a one liner. And just put that in the in the test, so that that flexibility is what I really like, um, and, and why I have a lot of fun, you know, working with this stuff. Um, sometimes it's interesting, maybe when things go wrong. Um, but what the cool thing about that is, is everything is a container, right? So if something did go wrong, I can actually connect into that container, right? So there's a there's the fly hijack command. Uh, well. The, Hijack, I guess, is actually the alternate name for it. It's actually the intercept, but hijack is more fun to type. Um, so I like being able to go in there and I can actually explore the container to find out, you know, maybe more information about what it is that happened. Like maybe, you know, you notice that I had a lot of different things where I was actually specifying the repo name, and how I got there is I found out like things weren't necessarily exactly exactly where I thought they would be. So I had to go in there and add that capability to. Um, ensure that things were, were where I expected to be. And I think that that whole idea of nothing is there unless you tell it to be there is probably the biggest stumbling block, right? right so this load test is still, is still running and that'll run for like another minute or so. Um, and then it does take about two minutes to get to the next step. So we still got another couple of minutes. Um, and, and I still have all you folks for another five minutes and you're not allowed to leave unless I say it's okay. Um, there, yeah, another question. Uh-huh. Yeah, so the, so the question was is that the, the, you know, the Python CLI that I'm using for the quality gates, you know, is that generally available? And the answer is yes, that the, the Python, the, that VTCLI is a is a fully open source project that my colleague Andy Bradner has created. Uh, that is right there. So that's github.com slash dynatrace slash dynatrace dash CLI. Um, the original use case behind the VTCLI was actually to be a reference implementation of Dynatrace API call. Right, um, and nowadays people create these kinds of things in Go, but my my uh, my my boss Andy likes uh, is a little bit more familiar with Python, so um, it's it's pretty neat. The other the only bad thing about the DTCLI, at least that that I ran into, for anybody that deals with Python on a regular basis, this is actually based on Python three. So like when you're on a Mac, you don't really have Python three, and you have to deal with Pi and V or you know what I what I did, and this is probably the best thing that I've ever read on Twitter ever. Is I think it was Jesse Frizzell was actually talking about using Docker containers for uh, CLI commands. So I started basically like when I'm working with the DT CLI locally, it's always in a Docker container. So I have a Docker container that I've created that actually sets all the prereqs for the DT CLI, and I just run it from there. And then I don't have to worry about Pi and B or any of that other garbage. Um, that's another fun takeaway for everybody, I guess. Um, yeah, so this is going to wait a little bit. Uh, it'll, it'll wait a second or two just to make sure that all the data has flown into Dynatrace. Um, all right, yeah, see we're red. So if we scroll down here, you'll see that we had two violations, right? And if we scroll up, right, we have a, a, a failure in response time. So we were, we were expecting 400,000, that's actually, for whatever reason, the Dynatrace CLI actually uses micro, like microseconds, right? It's not milliseconds. Um, so it was supposed to be, you know, we can just pretend to do the math in our heads. It was supposed to be 400 milliseconds, um, and it was actually more like three seconds, which is kind of bad. Um, and then the same thing that happened to our average as well. So both of these were violations, right? And we see down there we had two violations. So we encountered Two non-spec violations were failing our build, 
And then you can see here that the push to prime didn't happen because we failed, which aborts our pipeline. Right. Um, but that same validation process could have actually been used to validate you know, architectural violations and things like that. That's just a little bit, a little bit tougher to demo. <laughs> All right, well, we are actually about done. It's 12.08, so if there aren't any other questions, I thank everybody for their time. Anything else?